Hello, and welcome to our channel, MarStream, your public performance broadcast platform. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also donate to our tip jar and support the arts and artists of MarStream by clicking the link below in the description. Check out our website, themarsh.org, for all upcoming live performances. Now, enjoy the show. How long have you guys been married? Oh, um, just about a year, actually. Oh, newlyweds. So no kids yet. No, well, just this one fur baby. We are dinks. Dual income, no kids. Aaron and I are those people that you see in the airport quietly reading a book and completing the entire crossword puzzle undisturbed while all around us, parents are mediating conflicts over who got the best bag of free peanuts. Hers had more nuts than mine. No, Noah, it didn't. There were exactly the same number of nuts. Nuh-uh. There's no one more exhausted looking than parents in the airport. But not us dinks. Nope, we're nursing our Starbucks and we don't have any strollers or diaper bags or have to balance a baby in our arms with three CPK pizzas while we look for the boarding passes. I mean, life for a dink is just a lot easier. But in time, things change. How about Diana? No. Mm, well, then you do one. Uh, Hazel? Oh, I love it. Hazel. So Hazel for a girl and Henry for a boy? Mm hmm I hope our Hazel has your kindness, honey, but my taste in music. We're gonna make a baby. I know, I love you so much. Later that week. Oh my God, Aaron, look. How old are you here? So cute. Um, oh, I'm eight, because I'm wearing my Cub Scout pin. Oh, your Cub Scout pin. I'm putting this up on the fridge. Just imagine someday this fridge will be covered with our own little Hazels and Henrys. I can't wait to decorate the nursery and take her to story time at the library. I can't wait to take him to the Exploratorium and tell him all about space. <laughs> we are going to have the nerdiest kid the next month. God, I don't feel good. I'm like nauseous and crampy and, and late. Oh! <gasps> Honey, this could be the month. I'm gonna go get a pregnancy test. Does that look like a plus sign to you? Uh-uh. Hmm. You know what? I'm gonna get us a book. You know, I... I figure like we just need to approach this like any other project with like a timetable and like a spreadsheet and a book. Okay, according to this, temperature's going up. It's gonna be today. No, tomorrow. No, today. Maybe we should just cover all our bases. You see a line? Mm-mm. You sure there's not at least maybe a faint line? I'm sorry, honey. Hey, how long have you guys been married? Oh, um, five years this month. Aw, happy anniversary. Wow, so do you have any little ones of your own? Oh, uh, not yet. Oh, I get it. 
you're still trying to convince him. <laughs> Been there, sister. You just keep at him. <sighs> Everyone asks. When you're in your 30s wearing a wedding ring, I mean, nobody means anything by it. First comes love, then comes marriage, then the baby carriage. Except when it doesn't. You know what? I got the test with the words this time. That way we won't miss anything. Not pregnant. You know, I saw online this woman, she was getting negative tests, but she was actually pregnant. You know, maybe that's happening to me. Maybe. As anyone who's ever tried to get pregnant will tell you, it is suddenly like the whole fucking world is pregnant. Like the gal at your nail salon, your coworkers, the woman in line in front of you at the post office, your Zumba instructor, all your family, your friends. In fact, by now, most of our friends already have kids. Wow, Harriet, you are so great with children. When are you guys gonna get some of your own? Oh, I don't know, someday. I mean, really? You are not getting any younger. You should get started. What's it been, like eight years since you guys got married? And besides, like, your parents would probably like some more grandkids. Uh, I'm sure that's true. Don't pay any attention to her, actually. You guys are so lucky not to have kids. I mean, enjoy it. You can go out anytime you want. You could stay out all hours, sleep in on the weekends, drink wine all day. Like, I mean, what I wouldn't give to have quiet in the house. It is quiet in the house. So fucking quiet. You know, when we first moved into this house, like, I pictured bringing a baby home to this room. Like, how I would decorate it with the little crib and the mobile and, like, a rocking chair there in the corner and a bookcase with all our picture books. Now I just wonder if there'll ever be a baby in this room. I just really thought this was going to be the month. <laughs> Me too, sweetheart. Me too. How perfect that you bleed every month when you find out you're not pregnant. Because it's like you're being gutted. Harriet, hi. Oh. Hi, Dr. Martin. Hi, Aaron. So, today's the day. Now, Aaron, we got your results back and they look great. Here's your copy of the report. I guess he's done his part. Now it's my turn. Okay, Harriet, lay back, put your feet up here, and let's make you a baby. In all my life, in all the ways I imagined this moment, I did not imagine it like this, with a five foot tall Asian woman in gloves beside me and my husband clear across the room. And call me old fashioned, but I didn't think there'd be a lady typing at the computer either. I mean, four is really a crowd when it comes to baby making. But the journey to this imperfect moment in this paper gown and this sterile cold room, well, it's just been like a continual revelation of all the ways life is not going to turn out the way that you planned. I mean, I crack up now thinking about those nights we spent in bed dreaming up baby names and imagining everything going according to some timetable in my head. At this point, I would take a baby however, whenever, whatever way I could get one, which is what had brought us here to the fertility clinic and Dr. Martin. But the thing is, we just couldn't seem to get one. Several rounds of IUI, that's intrauterine insemination, 
that's like the cheap first date on the path to IVF. We just kept keep coming up empty. So we make an appointment to see the doctor. But this time, it's a different doctor. I'm Dr. Slovak. Oh, you know, we were expecting Dr. Mocklin. Oh, yes, Dr. Martin's out on um, leave. It's, it's kind of sensitive. Oh, I hope she's okay. Oh, yes, yeah, she's fine. It's just she's out on maternity leave. It, she had twins. When I say everyone was getting pregnant, I mean fucking everyone. Even my IVF doctor, who's supposed to be getting me pregnant. I want to show you something. You see this right here? That is your ovarian reserve, like how many eggs you have left. Now, two years ago, it was here. A year ago, it was here. Six months ago, here. Now, it's here. You're losing eggs every month. <sighs> when we started this, I was 39. Advanced maternal age. That's what they write on my chart. By now, I'm 42. Downright geriatric eggs. I get the gist. It's now or never. We move on to IVF, in vitro fertilization. Now, I can sum up IVF in five things. Number one, the box of shots and medicines they gave was so big that it barely fit through my front door. And when I took it all out to inventory it, you get so many shots, you have to inventory it. It took up half of my dining room table and an entire shelf in my refrigerator. I'm gonna put all of that in my body in one month? Fuck. Number two, you get so many shots that they draw circles and permanent marker on each ass cheek so your husband knows where to jab you each night. You do get to keep the Sharpie, so that's a bonus. Number three, they make you take a two hour injection class and some dude in the class asks, uh, when do we get to pick the sex of our baby? An asshole. What kind of jackass wants to design their baby? It's probably from a tech company. My doctor told me that the tech companies give six free cycles of IVF to every employee. That is like $100,000 of free fertility treatment. You know how much my nonprofit insurance covers? <sighs> Nothing. I thought the Google bus was a perk. But actually, I mean, I'm lucky to even be able to do this at all. Because it is, this is number four, fucking expensive. And there's no guarantee that it's going to work. It's the scariest, most uncertain thing I have ever done. But I want to be a mother. And no matter what I've tried to do, nothing fills that gap. Number five, it's a game of statistics and luck. Now some people, like that guy, are probably gonna get 25 or 30 eggs and maybe 12 good embryos. At my age, I'll be lucky to get four eggs, two or three embryos, and hope that one of them works. You only need one to work, my doctor likes to say. Some bruises, some welts, 10 ultrasounds and a full sharps container later. And we've made it to the night before our embryo transfer. The nurse calls. Good news. All four of your eggs fertilized. You have four solid embryos that will transfer them all tomorrow. Honey, it's happening. I can't believe it. That night I had a dream. There was a young girl, two or three, running through a sunny summer field at the golden hour, light dancing off of her blonde bouncing ringlets. And she looked back over her shoulder with me, at me with the biggest, happiest smile as she ran into the early evening light. She was joy in human form. And in that moment, I knew, that's my daughter. I woke up from that dream and I cried. It was the first time I ever allowed myself to really imagine my child. And I believe I dreamed her into being that night with all of my longing and the giant hole in my heart that I had carved out just for her. 
The next day we went to the fertility clinic for our embryo transfer. Dr. Martin hands me a photograph, a black and white five by seven, a series of circles each divided into more circles. Here are your embryos. They look perfect. I watched in the darkened room on the video monitor as the lab tech pipettes the embryos and brings them into the room. And I watch on the screen as the doctor releases them into my body. The simple culmination of so many years of waiting and hoping. The whole ride home in the car, I stare at the photograph, counting the circles. 17 perfect little cells. Only I don't see cells. I see those blonde ringlets and the girl in my dream. I see us picking out her back to school backpack. I see the little person who will take her seat with us at the dining room table and who's going to make our house come alive with her finger paints and a jumble of toys on the living room floor. And when I go home, I go straight to the fridge and scoot all the photos out of the way to make a space in the middle for that five by seven. Baby's first picture. Attach, I whisper each night in bed. Attach. Welcome baby, we already love you so much. I wonder if she's gonna have your red hair, Erin. I wanna be a mother with every fiber of my being. And I think about that smiling, curly haired girl smiling over her shoulder at me, beckoning me on this journey. It's gotten so hard over the years to say it out loud. How much I want this after so much disappointment. It's scary to want something so much and have so little control over it. Like what if I let out all my wild, spilling out all over the place desperation and I can't put it back again if things don't work out. Two days later, I'm home making a garden burger when the nurse calls. I have been waiting all day for this call ever since I left the lab. Harriet, we got your results. Yes. Unfortunately, you're not pregnant. I'm sorry. I sit on the sofa in stunned silence. And then I get up and resume cooking my veggie burger. And two minutes later, the breath goes out of me and I double over with my spatula still in my hand and wail. Ah! And when I stand back up, there they are on the fridge. Those 17 perfect cells. What do you do when you just can't will life to turn out the way that you hoped it would? It took me five days after that phone call before I could take that photo down from the fridge. And when I did, it just left this giant, gaping, empty white space. I couldn't bear to rearrange anything to fill it back up. Because honestly, what could ever take the place of a baby? We're back in the fertility clinic, debriefing the last failed IVF cycle. So I know the embryos looked really good, but sometimes it doesn't work. And especially with older eggs, there can be problems that we can't see. So we have some options. You can go forward. We can try a few more times and we'd have the same odds, which aren't great. You know, we'd be hoping for three or four eggs, but even with all of those, the odds of getting pregnant are probably five to 7%. Or you could consider getting an egg donor. Now with an egg donor, because those eggs are 
so much younger, the odds of getting pregnant with even just one egg is 70%. And you'd have a lot more eggs to try with. Like if we do this, you should be prepared to get pregnant the first time around. I mean, you could be pregnant by Christmas. Wow. Okay, egg donor. Full disclosure, I always thought that sounded so extreme, like sci-fi extreme. But I mean, actually, when we started all of this, I thought IVF sounded extreme. I just can't stop thinking about what she said. I could be pregnant by Christmas? Think of the last 10 Christmases with our stockings hung up there, wishing there was another stocking. And I know it, it's so expensive, but in my head, I just see that little girl running through that field, looking back over her shoulder at me. And suddenly this seems like the path to get to her. Something that seemed so weird just feels like a solution what's involved well um you meet with the psychologist to talk through the procedure you pick out an egg donor from our list or from a donor agency when you match you do the drugs it's pretty similar to before wow that's fast we spend about a week thinking about it, talking about it, and sure, there's grief, like closing the door on my own genetic child. I'm never gonna look at her and say, oh, that's my laugh. She has my eyes and nose. But every time I think about it, I just keep thinking, I could be holding my baby a year from now. We decide to go forward and we meet with the psychologist. Most couples that come to see me, they're still in a state of indecision or maybe one partner's unsure. So we can talk about the procedure, answer questions. We're on board, we're both on board. I think our main question has more to do with like, how do we make this okay for our future child? I don't want her to wake up one day and feel like we kept something from her or like, feel unlike me in some way that makes her feel alone. The best thing you can do is be open. You know, tell your child early and often. There are books you can read. She gestures behind herself at a row of books, one about sperm donation, one about egg donation, one about surrogacy. There's a whole bevy of books, one for every flavor of the infertility alphabet. Just read the book every so often. And eventually, when your child asks questions, be honest. We wanted you so much, but mommy's needed help because her eggs weren't working. So we got someone to help, an egg donor. And then that helped us make you, and you grew in mommy's belly, and then you were born, and we were so happy to have you to love. Children do best when they just always knew, and it was never a surprise. Okay. We are going to have a baby with an egg donor, we hope. I'm at Safeway, staring down a wall of egg cartons. Fuck, I forgot to get eggs at Trader Joe's this morning. There's so many, like, cage-free, organic, certified, humanely raised, omega-3 enriched, Pasture, free range, large, extra large. I mean, there's a dizzying array of options. Mostly, I just keep looking at the prices. Six dollars for a dozen eggs? The Trader Joe's, they're a lot cheaper than this. I guess eggs are a precious commodity everywhere. I take the ones that are cheapest, large cage-free eggs. Because honestly, this feels like a racket. How different can all these eggs be anyway? Once you cook them, they're all the same, right? Fuck, 
I can't even pick eggs at the supermarket. How am I going to pick an egg for my baby? Karen and I are at home in the living room, each staring at different laptop screens. I'm clicking from a table into a multi-page document, a narrative form with written and typed responses, a photo gallery, a pedigree chart and family tree, a long technical letter from a geneticist, GPAs, SAT scores. I click around for 15 or 20 minutes to see what feels like a dissertation of information on each name. How do you want to do this? I don't know, there's so many. Yeah, there's uh, 76. I mean, I guess it's good to have choices though. Yeah, it's just that like, by the time I look at them all, I have trouble remembering one from the other. I know, I'll make a chart. That'll help us narrow down the list. Ever the project manager and this will be no different. I've created a table with three columns, yes, no, and maybe. We'll mark each name and we'll rate each person. First off, do we have any requirements or deal breakers? Well, smart is important to me and healthy. I don't really care about ethnicity. How about you? Um, well, smart and healthy is also important. I mean, the truth is I know some people are trying to make like a Harvard educated supermodel, but what I really want is to feel like this person's kind of like me, you know, so I'm a little in the mix in there. Plus the nurse said it needs to be somebody that I like, that we'll know it when we see it. We start with number one. Okay, she's a scientist, Russian ancestry, 4.0 GPA, speaks three languages. It says she enjoys hiking, playing the violin. She's, she's kind of serious though and a little introverted. I think she's a maybe. We spend a good 10 minutes talking about each of the first ones. By the time we get to number eight, we are much more efficient. No mental illness, no birth defects, good GPA, cute childhood photos, yes column. It becomes a project of rote categorization. I tell my therapist, I feel like I'm designing a puppy and it feels so wrong. I feel so guilty. I mean, here we are, so grateful that anyone is even willing to do this for us. And then we're like judging their pedigrees and answers to questions about what their favorite foods are. Who cares if they like nachos or Reese's peanut butter cups? Okay, Erin, we have 19 yeses and 18 maybes. We need to narrow it down. We look back at our lists. The Russian scientist is too staid. She's not creative and she sounds very introverted. I say no. Okay, well this gal Winnie is only four foot 10. Isn't that kind of short? Unless you're a gymnast. I say no. Well, what about Stephanie? She's six foot four, isn't that kind of tall? <sighs> I think no too. God, I do feel like I'm designing a puppy. This feels so wrong. We end up with a list of 14, the top five that are highlighted. Okay, so are we good with these? We send off our list. I feel really good about this, like, I mean, excited. Like one of these people might be our egg donor. They might help us make a baby. A week later, the phone rings. Hi, I'm Sarah, your egg donor coordinator. I'm gonna be helping with your match. I wanted to go through your choices. Now, oh, already? This is so exciting. Okay, for Laura, you're 14th on the wait list. 14th? 14th? Mm-hmm. For Sheila, you're ninth. You were seventh for Sarah. Fourth for Carrie. Now you were second for Maria. And I need to check, but I think the couple that's in front of you is going to match with somebody else. In fact, I'm pretty sure. Disappointed. Hopeful. Overwhelmed. Excited. Confused. I feel like I'm buying a racehorse. Or that I'm in like some home buying effort in the Bay Area with like multiple cash only offers in front of me and the houses keep slipping through my fingers. 
we leave the call with two possible options out of our 14. But you're gonna need to let me know within 48 hours. Honey, what do you think? Um, well, Alicia was on our, um, Maria was on our yes list. I look back at the profile. She's a doctor, she's healthy, she's 28. She's already had a little girl of her own. That's a good sign. Yeah, and she said that she matched with two previous couples and they both had healthy babies. And also that this is her last batch of eggs. I know it, it doesn't really matter, but she is the person whose childhood photo looked the most like me. I read her profile again. I'm a kind and loving person, determined, persistent and fun. I'm a great communicator and passionate. I'm optimistic and funny and smart. I think it sounds kind of like me. Oh, she wrote an, a, a message to the egg donor recipients. I've been through this process before. It's truly an amazing experience to be able to help someone else become pregnant and have children, especially because I'm a mother myself. I'm so grateful to have my daughter and every day when I wake up and see her, my day is filled with love. I don't know what I would do if I couldn't have had her. I hope someday you can have a child so you can know this extraordinary love. It's the best experience ever and I hope that anyone who wants to have a child should be given the opportunity. She's our person. I just know. This is the person that's gonna make it possible for me to be a mom. I hope. I study her pictures. There she is at four, chubby cheeks, deep brown eyes, curly hair, and then at six and then as a teenager in her 20s. To be honest, they each look like such different people from one photo to the next. And I think about how at certain times in my life, I looked much more like my mom at one stage and then more like my dad at another. How have that shifted back and forth over the years? Will it matter that she doesn't have my eyes or my nose? Thank God she won't have to get my boobs. But who cares anyway? I want her to be happy and curious and to feel loved and safe. And I want to get to be her mom. I'm at dinner in Saratoga in a house overlooking Silicon Valley. And little three-year-old Annie is looking up at me with her doe eyes. She's smiling as I tell a story. And I look up to my right and there is her mom, a mirror image of little Annie with the same doe eyes and hair and sweet smile. So what's the next step? When should we be crossing our fingers? That's Roger. That's Annie's dad and Caroline's husband. We all went to college together 20 years ago. Well, we picked out our donor, so um, we should get started in just a few weeks. Roger and I were talking and like, I don't know if we would do it, like how we'd feel about it if it was only gonna be like one of our DNA in there. I get it. I get it. But the thing is, nobody starts out with this as the goal. But what happens is like slowly over time, you try all the other things and they don't work. And by the time you get here, you just feel like this is the path to get you where you want to go. And the odds are so much better. Like they said, I have like a 7% chance with my own eggs and a 70% chance with just one of her eggs. I eventually realized this was just a better choice for us. It sounded confident, but on the ride home, I just keep thinking about it. Like, am I gonna miss out on something? Will anyone ever look at my child and say, oh, she goes with her? Does that change how you love them? Or 
Does it change how they love you? That night I have a fevered dream. There's a young girl and she's lost from me. I run after her, but no matter how fast I run, she's always a bit beyond where I can reach. I call to her, but she can't hear me. I wake up in a sweat. <sighs> hey, are you gonna give the baby a Mexican name? Since the mom is Mexican? But I'm, I'm the mom, I wanna say. That just raises more questions. If the egg is Mexican, is that part of her heritage? Or is that appropriation? Like if our baby is raised by two white people in Berkeley, is it fair to claim that as part of her heritage? Why would we name her that? Somehow this simple question about name sends me down a spiral. Like are people not gonna see me as her legitimate mother? Is there gonna be some part of her I can't fill? The thing is, if we were adopting a child from Mexico, I wouldn't think it was odd to give a name with that heritage. But we bought donated eggs. They'll gestate in me and be born out of my body and be raised by us. So where does that leave the Mexican heritage of that DNA? All these things used to be a lot clearer to me. Like, I'm just grateful anyone would do this for us. And I will love our baby with everything I have. So who cares about any of this stuff? Like if someone just placed a baby in my arms from who knows where, I would be so grateful. How is this any different? But somehow it feels like it is. Because when you have to choose, you have to consider. And in considering, you have to value and judge things. You have to be aware of all of it. So you can't be agnostic about it even if you want to. It turns out egg donor IVF is pretty similar to regular IVF, except instead of a big box of medication and shots, you just get a ginormous envelope. Two weeks later, we got nine embryos. And this time they only transferred one. That's how potent they are. Two weeks after that, we got another call from the nurse. Hi, Harriet. Yeah. Congratulations, you're pregnant. <sighs> hey, come on the back, end. Harriet. Thank you. Thank the you end so of part much. One. For... Uh, okay. Uh, Glad you said that. And hi, everybody. I'm, I'm David Harada. I'm the Director of Artist Relations here, and I'll be uh, running our uh, Q&A here. Harriet, um, so, okay, I'm so glad to hear that. End of part one. Um, work in progress here, obviously. Um, do, do you, uh, I, I really don't want the spoiler, because I would love to come back to this when part two is done, but do you have a sense of where you're going um, I have part two. It's just, it's beyond the time okay. we allotted for tonight. So, um, okay. yes, it, I have the entire show written. I'm just still working on it with, uh, David. Awesome. And that's David Ford, I assume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I will invite everyone, uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or on zoom to, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, throw them in the chat. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that so that we can keep the lines of communication open. Um, and so this is, at least as far as I know, your third show, you, you did Times Unseen at the Marsh, and you've, you've done SF Festival and, and uh, Fringe Festival. Yes. Um, and so, so you're, this is not your first rodeo. No. Um, and um, now I just, I guess, lost my uh, train of thought on where that question was going. I'm sorry. Um, what was did this uh now I, I will say that having talked to you before this as we were setting up and knowing that now you uh have a baby asleep in the in the next room i do i i i, I would have been kind of a wreck not knowing that as as you went through this 
Um, one thing that did strike me is um, the good humor with which you, the narrator, um, dealt with the, the the questions of of people. It's like, oh, when are you going to? Do you have kids yet? When are you going to have kids? Um, and then, as as you go down this, take this journey, um, as as these types of questions and comments become ever more, maybe not intrusive, but certainly they hit so much harder. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. I mean, particularly this this sense of I think goodwill and humor you have towards it. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in general. The, I tend to write from deeply, you know, felt experiences. And I found that humor is an important sort of balance in um, not just in this art form and helping that be something that, you know, audiences can live through, but it's also a tool for living through hard things is to sort of be able to see the the humor in every day. And so I appreciate being able to sort of intersperse that. And, and there are, you know, always, easier days and harder days when you're going through hard things in life. And so I feel like there could be days when someone's question is just like gutting and you come home and cry or, you know, you lash out or something, but there are also days when you just say, you know, they don't know. They're just, they are ultimately just making conversation and nobody means anything um, badly by it. So what I've found interesting is as I've gone through this experience and these experiences is the world of people who've had these experiences is actually much more than we realize. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of sensitivity out there and a lot of people that are compassionate about what's hard about um, the, a journey of infertility or fertility treatment or mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and I've found a lot of solace in the way that those people have stepped forward to be supportive and to provide, um, you know, some, some help in times where maybe other people who are less personally affected by that maybe are insensitive in ways they don't mean to be. So um, I do think that humor is important. I also think like sort of assuming positive intent is important. Um, sure. And then the truth is that when you're going through something that feels lonely and painful, um, you're going to have all the feelings of the rainbow about those experiences. And art is a great way to channel that and also hopefully to share something and connect with other people who maybe have had that experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's great. Um, I, I love hearing that perspective. Now it, it, as I was, um, watching your piece here, um, from your comments, I'm thinking I'm a little bit older than you, not by a lot, but it made me realize, wow, I remember vividly. I was in high school when Louise Brown, we didn't know that was her name at the time. Uh, this what the world called then the first test tube baby was born and what a big deal that was um, and then as a as a I, I'm a biology student I, I have two biology degrees so sort of there's a way I think about this I think or you know the scientific mind and then to have you describe this journey so vividly here puts it back kind of almost into that, that, that feeling I kind of imagine maybe so much of the world had back in, I think it was 78. Um, and um, do, do you have any insight on kind of how the, the world as a whole is? is uh, I think um, um, what I could comment on about that is when my husband and I first many, many years ago now went to the sort of orientation session at the fertility clinic, that's like, the, you know, you're in a room full of people. And first of all, we felt so old already at the time, 36, yeah. 37, we felt so old. And then I looked around the room and I realized there are people older than us here. We're not that old, but also what struck us was, wow, there's a solution. Like there's, the science is so amazing. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing when they describe Now that doesn't mean it works for everybody. And so I also want to normalize that for some people, it never works. I know people that did cycle after cycle after cycle and it didn't work. But I also know people that had 13 miscarriages and then IVF worked for them. And so um, I think just to sort of recognize how far the science has come um, and, and yet also there's still just so much uncertainty. So um, it's powerful to see in a generation of people, you know, what, what progress can be made. Um, and it's also 
just interesting. There's, you know, raises a lot of ethical issues people feel all over the map about, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're on board with this or not. And ultimately it's a very personal decision about where people feel comfortable and don't, where they draw a line. And um, so there's way more even that I've written about this that is not in the, you know, doesn't make the cut about all the other things that we thought about and talked about in our own family. Um, but I was just grateful that that science did exist and there were people who had solutions for some of the challenges that we were facing. Yeah, and I, I just really appreciated the way you went through all your all your own uncertainties and and these things that were, were you at all surprised at, at how uh, this experience of turning to IVF did that reveal things to you were these were these feelings about oh uh what, what ethnicity does the baby get to claim or even do i get to claim kinship you, you know you you kind of ask that question or to what degree do i truly get to ask kinship was this a surprise to you as you rode so that it's wave interesting. it's interesting because i have very close family members who have both adopted and done ivf so i mm -hmm. i have a deep acceptance of sort of like, I didn't start this feeling like a family only looks a certain way or that wasn't sort of the issue at all. In fact, we were very open on ethnicity. One of the most interesting things we learned was we were like, we'll take, we don't, that just, that is not important to us. Um, what's important to us is that we have a healthy baby and also that it feel okay to the child, whatever we do. But we found that actually it was Chinese eggs that were the most sought after and the waiting list could be three or four years long because in that culture, people were not mostly telling anyone that they were doing this. And so it was really important to them to have a 100% ethnically Chinese child. And so that was like, again, there were these things in the process that we learned that we, we would have made a different assumption that maybe mm -hmm. in the adoption world, you know, the waiting lists are longer for certain groups and not others. And so um, I think what, what, what I learned is that I had a much deeper sense of compassion. I thought I understood these things, but until you're faced with these decisions yourself, it's just a different, it's a whole different experience once you go through it. And I realized like, oh, I have so much more understanding and compassion for people that have been through this now than I, than I did. And I didn't realize how much I didn't understand about this process. I do think there are things about, um, and this isn't even true just about an egg donor and picking all of those things out, but there are things that get simplified when you just get pregnant randomly um, or even if you're trying and it happens quickly, you don't have to consider all these things. You don't have to, mm -hmm. try to it just happens and then you work it out. And so um, it's, I think it's more of the matter of like, you suddenly are holding all these puppet strings or you feel like you are yeah. and it, it's unnatural to have to make all of those decisions mm -hmm. when you would have honestly been open to kind of whatever uh, transpired, but it just didn't work out that way for you. So you have to be more, you know, in there and, um, yeah, I do think there you could have a whole other thing about um, ad adoption. There's all these other solutions, right? Surrogacy. I, I know people that have done all of the all of the above. So, um, but yeah, this was just something that I found that there are people who've done who've used egg donors a lot more than you realize. But until mm -hmm. you talk about it, most people feel shame about it, or they feel some sense of um, you're not supposed to say, or we don't feel comfortable saying, or what are people going to think? So. I just felt like I learned a lot about this process and going forward and we had been so open already about the challenges that we'd had along the way that it didn't feel like such a huge leap to just say, this is what we're trying. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. I mean, I have two or three friends who I know have, have, have gone through something like this, but I've wondered sometimes, you know, how many mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I mean, I loved that line when you, when you were talking about all, all these choices that, that you had to make very, consciously and deliberately and make charts and stuff and you say you can't be agnostic about it you can't and, and it made me just think about how much i was sort of able to skate over um in that experience because because it just wasn't a, a necessary conscious decision mm -hmm. um uh you I, I i just i just feel that you're so honest in your writing here but i i have to ask maybe just because I want to feel that WTF moment again, but that box of injection crap, I mean, really, are we talking 
yes. would not fit through your door? It almost would not fit through the door. And inside there were like, I just kept taking things out. I felt like I was, you know, like Mary Poppins bag. And then <laughs> um, half of them were in this cooler that had to be, you know, kept at a certain temperature. Like I literally asked the nurse on the phone, like, oh, I could just pick it up at CVS. She was like, no, it has to be signed for it. Has like, And then when it arrived, I understood like what she was saying. I mean, it was just so many and all the supplies and all the medications and all the drugs and all the syringes and all the, I mean, everything you need for a month of uh, a hormonal adjustment and all the other things that are happening. So, wow. Th that's just astonishing. Um, and, um, I, I, and now I, as I was watching this and, and again, I so appreciate your, your, your honesty and the vulnerability you 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 have with it and this sense of compassion you as the writer you as the narrator as the character that comes through um, but of course this is this is so deeply personal not just for you but for your child uh, son or daughter I didn't daughter. get that book. daughter um, and for your husband and uh, typically here with with Monday nights uh, of course we are broadcasting live on YouTube right now we are here on zoom and then typically these are archived on our March stream YouTube channel. Um, and, and so you don't have to answer this now, but I'd like, I would like to, you can't answer it now or we can follow up later, whether that's okay with you, that this is, this is on your, uh, our YouTube channel. It becomes, it's on the internet. It's kind of potentially there in some sense forever. And, and, um, uh, so, so I think I changed all the names that I needed to change in anticipation okay. of that. So uh -huh. um, I want to review the tape myself just to make sure that I did, but I'm pretty sure I changed all of the names. And um, we have made the decision in our family that this is just something we will, that's, you know, we will share with our daughter. We already have read her the books multiple times and mm -hmm. she's only eight months mm -hmm. old. Um, and the, the goal is, you know, so I don't feel uh, a secrecy about that or a concern okay. about that as long as we've adjusted the names and I believe that we have, so. Okay, I, I, and that's wonderful because the, this is typically the part where I say to the everyone in the audience that if you know people who were not able to be here tonight, who were not able to see this, um, we, we typically archive these performances so you can tell people, oh, you missed this great show, check it out on the March Stream YouTube page. But let's, Harriet, you and I, um, kind of give you a chance to, to sort of make sure we're cool with this. I, I, I love the idea of, of more and more people seeing this and of you um, performing the, the entire Yeah, version. I look forward to that as well, because part two is just as eventful and exciting. So um, I look forward to being able to do the entire show um, and uh, you know bring people full circle on that journey it, with the most satisfying ending, which we all want, which um was the birth of our daughter so that's awesome um um shoot well i, I was just gonna go somewhere with the the um archived thing and um shoot i'm just losing my losing my no oh actually i did want to for those of you who um it, I thought I thought I, you you have a lovely website, and for those who might like to keep track of you, okay, if I toss that into the chat for absolutely those who'd like that, that is going there because you've uh, you've written two other shows that at least that have been produced, at least that that I saw there. Uh, you write poetry as well, and you you speak and you write uh, more academic type things for work. You've uh, accomplished a great deal. That there's a lot that you do there and I think uh, and uh, so I encourage you all if you if you've liked this to um, follow follow up with Harriet and hopefully new versions oh yes I remember I wanted to say that you know we are hopefully looking at the end of uh, shelter in place I, I mean I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel and you are a theatrical performer you're a live stage Perform, but I thought you and David did a fantastic job of adapting this for the Zoom environment. Thank you. And yeah, your your relationship to the space, and the way you sort of bring us, the audience, getting to play the character of you know the books on the shelves or the the chart you're reading, was a really it gave a delightful sense of the intimacy 
of that solo performance can give and and so kudos to you for Thank for you so making much. that adjustment um i just want to hop over to the youtube make sure that we're not getting any questions from there um so um anything anything that's coming up that you'd like to let the audience know i mean of course we can check on your on your website but any any projects um other this than this is you'd my like to... um coming out of hiatus after um the latter parts of pregnancy and having a newborn so this is my first uh sort of reading slash performance in that time so i'm looking forward to kind of getting back in the swing of things after this um but i just completed the script so we're uh, working on some of the performance elements and i hope to have other performance dates coming up in the in the near term yeah, that, that'll that'll be great and um so uh uh before before we go uh i just i just had two questions i had to ask you um that are going to seem a little weird um because you mentioned this on your website um your your uh liking for breakfast tacos any any recommend any good breakfast taco recipes that's my first no, my question. very favorite is a very simple classic it's just egg potato and cheese on a little um you can do it on a mini flour tortilla or you can do it in the like classic in texas i feel like they they do but i have adjusted to corn tortillas now um for breakfast tacos um and to be honest i like a little pickled red onion on mine i've started Ooh. making pickled red onions in the covid <laughs> and uh, in the lockdown and it's uh if you if you want a great simple recipe for pickled red onions email me or go on my website leave me a message or something okay. and I will, uh, definitely send it your way because it's super easy and it's great on tacos tostadas breakfast tacos eggs like all of that around town um my favorite it's not a breakfast taco but my favorite actually um they do some really nice uh, chilaquiles at uh, a little place in West Berkeley that I'm blanking on the name of it because okay. it used to be Jimmy Beans and I used to go there and get it at Jimmy Beans and now I'm like, I don't know what they are now, Llama Beans okay. and they were, yeah, so, but um, Llama Beans, yeah. Um, those are really good chilaquiles, but honestly, I just love to make breakfast tacos on a Saturday morning and when I visit Texas, we eat breakfast tacos every day um, <laughs> when I visit my family at home, so um, yeah, just love a good... Love a good breakfast tacos. Love migas. Love some chili quiles. Okay. Can't go wrong. I will be ask. I will be asking you. I will be Please emailing do. you about it's those so uh, pickled red onions. Five simple ingredients and it delicious. And then um, my my final question to you, uh, as a parent with fond memories of those um, less than one year toddlers, is is your daughter uh, uh, furniture surfing yet, as we call it? She's just starting to do some of that, but she's the, she's really like the ace commando crawler and she has such great speed and it's like directly proportional to how much she can see the cat across the room, how fast she can crawl. So we're, um, we're enjoying this day. She's gone in her first swimming pool. She's gone uh, on lot. She loves the swing at the park. She wrote, she, she saw her first goats and everything at a farm last weekend. So she's getting around, you know, given COVID and lockdown and all those things mm -hmm. we're, um, we're excited that she's able to experience some of the wonders of the world and looking forward to experiencing a lot more as the world opens back up again. When, when we do open up, I am going to really smile at the prospect of you and your husband finally getting to take her to the Exploratorium. That would That's going to be a real awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Nerds. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this and um, keep in touch. Uh, uh, let us know how this is going and, um, we're so glad you could share this with us, and I'm glad that you've got this project up and going in, in shelter in place, and uh, we'll look forward to, to seeing more of it. Thank you so much, and thanks to everybody that came out um, to be a part of this. Yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. Um, and so uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. Uh, again, Brianna mentioned it. We've got Jeff Hoyle this weekend, uh, video on demand, wonderful, wonderful show. If you can support us through the tip jar, it's great. Um, we're here every Monday and we've got just so much going on. So we'll hope to see you in our Zoom room and live, God willing, soon enough. And uh, so Harriet, um, thanks again. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, and, and good luck with all those, those little baby adventures. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thanks, everyone. And uh, good night to you all.
How do I describe my journey with me? your mother? Who thanks crowd you? Who thanks you to the doctor when you're sick? Your mother. <laughs> sushi for the first time and she liked it. I see that change can happen. I know things can shift and change for good. I am dizzily dazzled with stars in my eyes. The same level as I broke my neck. But he's not getting the same return of function I am. And I don't want any of your smart aleck sex talk that I usually get when I get home. This is beyond the marsh because what you're doing is planting beautiful seeds for artists to grow.